Astrology is the idea that each planet in our solar system has a unique energetic field that is strong enough and powerful enough to affect life on Earth and throughout the solar system. It's the concept that there are unseen influences in space which affect us much like invisible environmental influences on Earth affect us. The planets are said to create new different kinds of energy as they move into different positions or aspects through their orbits in our solar system. And astrology also puts forth the idea that around our planet are these certain zones or sectors of space called signs of the zodiac. And that these 12 areas of space also carry their own unique energetic blueprint that affects life on Earth somehow. And that all of these factors are said to combine to impact human beings at the time of their birth in ways that are carried with them for the rest of their life. This is sort of like saying that the season a person is born in could affect their personality, and indeed there have been countless studies published in major peer-reviewed and highly respected journals that have shown that the season someone is born in does affect their mind in very deep ways for the rest of their life. There was a recent study coming out of Budapest which analyzed over 400 people found there was a direct link between their personality and the season they were born in. People born in summer were more likely to be optimistic and prone to mood swings. People born in winter were shown to be less angry than others and people born in August were the least depressed. Now of course this is due to environmental influences on Earth, not the planets in our solar system. But the question becomes, what about the season of the solar system? What about when the Sun is in Virgo and Mars is in Leo and Jupiter is in Gemini? Could that affect us somehow? Could different seasons of our cosmic calendar somehow affect the people on Earth, similar to the seasons on Earth affecting us? So that's the idea of astrology. The very first scientist to ever produce rigorous scientific research on astrology was Carl Gustav Jung. Jung was of course one of the great pioneers of the entire field of psychology. He was one of the founders of psychology back um, almost well over a hundred years ago. He gave us common terms like introversion, extroversion, synchronicity, archetypes, and many others. He founded uh, the tradition of analytical psychology that's sometimes called depth psychology, through which many people have become licensed psychotherapists worldwide. Uh, Jung studied all things mystical and occult. He was famous for that. But he was famous for doing so in purely a scientific manner. He was skeptical that these concepts could literally be true, and instead he was more interested in this symbolic relationship that they held with the human psyche. What does it mean subconsciously? What do these symbols mean subconsciously? What does astrology mean subconsciously? What does alchemy mean in, in regards to the human psyche? And he, but he was an ideal scientist in the sense that he was both skeptical and open-minded. And he wanted to look at everything and figure out what the truth was. And he had written about the science of the zodiac and discussed how they represent archetypes that lay deep within the human subconscious mind. But at one point he decided he actually wanted to study astrology. He wanted to see if there's any meat behind it, if astrology could, in fact, describe someone's personality and their relationships. So he contacted astrologers from four different countries, and he was able to get astrology readings from married couples that were made over a period of several years. And the couples obviously had no idea their charts would be used for this purpose, it was completely random. He ended up getting astrology charts for 483 married couples. So in total, there were 966 individual charts. And he conducted a statistical analysis of all of these charts, and to his surprise, he found that 936 out of the 966 charts had an extremely large proportion of the very same contacts between the Sun, the Moon, Venus, and Mars, which astrologers say indicate marriage and romantic relationships. 
And so he contacted his mathematician friend, Basil, who is none other than the famous quantum physics pioneer, Marcus Fires. And when Professor Fires crunched the numbers, he calculated that the odds that this could have happened by chance were upwards of 10 million to one. This was a 96.8% correlation between what astrologers say indicates marriage and what was in the charts of these married couples. Jung was obviously very shocked by this. He had gone into the experiment actually expecting to disprove astrology. And so he ended up doing this experiment three times, using different methods each time just to make sure he didn't screw anything up. And each time he was able to come up with these amazing results. And the whole thing obviously radically changed his view on astrology, as at this point he really had no choice but to conclude that he'd found something here. And Jung did publish this research, so if you want to read more about the details surrounding this study, you can pick up a copy of The Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche, available at your local bookstore or library, Amazon, whatever. But, you know, the, the interesting point here is that Jung was the first scientist who was not in some sort of occult, Middle Ages, secret society or something that we don't know about to do any sort of rigorous scientific study on, astro on astrology, any analysis of astrology, anything. Yet his discoveries are almost universally unknown. When was the last time any of us heard someone bring up this study when they were talking about astrology? It's, it's very, very unknown. But while Jung was the first scientist to study astrology, he certainly was not the last. So now we come to the most famous scientific research ever done on astrology, which comes from a French scientist by the name of Michel Gauquelin. Gauquelin was a statistician and a psychologist who had an interest in astrology at a young age, but as he grew older and he went through his scientific training, he started to see it as absurd. He became very bitter towards astrologers who he was seeing as complete charlatans, but he was a smart guy, so he thought instead of just denying astrology, he would attempt to disprove it. So he set about studying what he felt was one of the most ridiculous claims of astrology, the idea of whether the planets can predict career path. Astrologers, of course, say that you can look at a person's birth chart and see where their ultimate career path lies. This is typically called vocational astrology, and you'll tend to see this effect most often in famous and successful people because usually they'll actualize their life path. So to test this idea, Michel Gauquelin studied the birth charts of over 20,000 famous people, and much to his surprise, he found that the birth charts accurately matched the career and personality of a very, very significant percentage of the people he was studying. And it was so significant that the possibility it could have happened by chance was 5 million to 1. There were many of the planetary positions that astrologers would say predict the given career path that were consistently showing up in the birth charts of the people who had chosen those professions. Athletes and military professionals had Mars conjunct their rising sign or their midheaven, just like astrologers say they would. Writers had the moon, actors and politicians had Jupiter, and scientists had Saturn. The results were shocking and they radically changed Gauquelin's views, and although he was still skeptical of astrology by itself, he couldn't deny the results he was finding. So the Mars effect was further replicated by other scientists who produced the same results, and still to this day scientists are publishing research which validates it. The most recent study that was published was relatively recent, but soon after the Mars effect was brought into scientific di discourse, the skeptic groups organized around it and they decided it was their duty to debunk it. So there's nothing wrong with that, of course. I mean, if if the Mars effect is, is true, if he was actually finding this effect, then when they look at it themselves, they should find the same thing. So they decided to do their own studies just to see if they could come up with the same results. And Gauquelin, of course, was a skeptic, so he was actually excited about this. He welcomed their investigations. The first group to do this was a famous Belgian skeptic group called the Belgian Committee for the Critical Analysis of Parasciences. This group not only successfully replicated the Mars effect when they did their own studies, they got the same results as Gauquelin, but they were so embarrassed by their findings that they withheld them for eight years. And then later on, 
the famous American skeptic group PSYCOP, or the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, took a slightly different approach than their Belgian counterparts. They did their own study, and initially they announced they could not replicate Gokulin's results. But that statement was soon disproven by PSYCOP members themselves, and it erupted into the biggest scandal the organization has ever seen. A senior member of the PSYCOP Council was a man named Dennis Rollins, who not only left the organization after their debunking attempt, but he wrote a very detailed article in Fate magazine which exposed the cover-up. He wrote that they bungled their major investigation, they falsified the results, they covered up their errors, and they even fired a colleague of his who threatened to tell the truth. So this became a huge scandal, it became known as the Gokulin Affair, and soon after other skeptics started calling the Psychop study, which was originally called the Zellin Test, into question. An entire edition of the popular skeptic journal, the Zetetic Scholar, was devoted to thoroughly debunking this Zellin test and showing how fraudulent Psychop had been. It was publicly exposed how the Psychop funded test initially supported Gokulin's findings. They, were, they found the same thing as Gokulin, the Mars effect. However, the three bitterly upset career debunkers in charge of the study resorted to falsifying the data, threatening people, and even firing people in an attempt to debunk the research and sweep this Mars Effect thing all under the rug. And this led to several members, including senior members, leaving the PSYCOP ranks. Since that time, there have been uh, very accomplished scientists who have pointed out in detail the numerous errors in the PSYCOP study. And two scientists, as an example, uh, who have produced studies which validate the Mars effect wrote a very thorough academic paper called Biased Data Selection in Mars Effect Research, which discusses uh, in detail the problems with the studies which it didn't replicate the Mars effect. And they also co-authored a book which goes into even more detail. And the reason we decided to discuss this so much in this video is because still to this day, skeptics hold up this Zellin test as the ultimate debunking of the Mars Effect. And if you were to do any research into the Mars Effect online, you're going to inevitably run into skeptic websites who will try to say that the whole thing has been disproven, and they're going to use typically this completely torn to pieces debunked Zellin test as their main source of proof, and they're not going to mention any of the things I just told you. So. You can do your own research. The Mars Effect has not been disproven. It's been thoroughly proven. But it was a quite a, a shock to the scientific establishment, and it still is. Gokulin was met with uh, scorn by most of the mainstream academic world, but so was every major scientific innovator before him. The terms introverted and extroverted are probably the most common terms in pop psychology. They were originally coined by the psychologist Carl Jung, who we discussed before, and they refer to the basic ways that people's mind functions. Introverts process things intro, uh, internally, whereas extroverts process things externally. Introverts uh, tend to recharge by being alone in nature, reading a good bo book, or just generally having time to themselves. And they tend to excel in environments where they have some degree of solitude, whereas extroverts, on the other hand, find rejuvenation in going to social events and being in high-energy, busy places such as packed restaurants, da dance clubs, etc. And they tend to excel in competitive team environments. There's been plenty and plenty of research done on this. Most people are familiar with this. What most people are not familiar with is, is that uh, astrologers have long said that you can find how introverted or extroverted someone might be by looking at their birth chart. People will tend to be more introverted um, if they are born under the uh, even-numbered signs, and they tend to be more extroverted if they're born on the odd-numbered signs. And that may be kind of confusing to people. Um, you look at the first sign, that's an odd-numbered sign. The second sign is an even-numbered sign and you just count from the first sign to the twelfth sign. People who are born under odd-numbered signs will be more extroverted. People who are born under even-numbered uh, even signs will be more uh, introverted. The more activity you have in those signs, the more of those qualities you'll demonstrate. And astrologers, just as a, a side note, have also said that people who have a lot of activity in, quote, water signs tend to be very emotional. 
So there were two studies that were conducted which showed this very connection. The first was published in the Journal of Social Psychology. The authors studied the sun signs of an astonishing 917 men and 1,407 women for a total of 2,324 people. The results of this were amazing. People born under the odd-numbered signs Aries, Gemini, Leo, Libra, Sagittarius, and Aquarius were statistically more likely to be extroverted. And they also found that just as astrologers say, those born under uh, even-numbered signs were more likely to be introverted. And it was also found, they just decided to throw this in there, it was also found that people who were born under water signs, i.e. Cancer, Pisces, and Scorpio, were statistically more likely to be irrationally emotional, or to use the scientific term neurotic. And another study was conducted almost 20 years later, which was published in the Journal of Psychology, Interdisciplinary and Applied, where the researchers took a uh, sample of uh, 190 students and were able to come up with the same results. So now we come to a subject of a more serious nature. And what subject could be more serious than the subject of serial killers? Yes, astrologers even say that certain factors in a birth chart can determine even the deepest parts of someone's psyche. That includes whether they will tend to be a sociopath, and if so, whether they will tend to be a sociopath with a tendency towards violence. Society often calls those people serial killers. It's said that the moon in specific positions can indicate whether or not someone may become a sociopath. Other things involved in finding serial killers are combinations of the 12th house, Pluto, mutable signs, and other factors. Now, Dr. Jan Rees had the idea to study the astrology charts of famous serial killers to find those connections. He wanted to see if the things that astrologers say should be in those charts were actually in those charts. The study he published was called uh, Statistical Analysis of the Birth Charts of Serial Killers, and it was an enormous success in the sense that he found positive results. He was able to find the exact correlations in the birth charts which astrologers say would be associated with serial killers. And this is such an interesting concept that it's, it's also been turned into a television show. In 1997, professional astrologer Carolyn Reynolds was brought onto the television series The Unexplained. She was given a set of random birth charts which had the charts of serial killers mixed in with them. So it was just a big old pile of birth charts and a few of them were famous serial killers and she was told to interpret all the charts, look at all of them, and to identify which ones were the serial killers. And she was able to do just that with 100% accuracy. Astrology is almost always applied to human beings, their behavior, their personality. But if it happens on human beings, it happens on animals, right? Because that's why all the research is done on animals. That's why all your products are tested on animals. Because if they're a mammal, they have basically the same sort of physiology as a human being. If it works on them, it works on human beings. They may be more sensitive, they may be less sensitive, but it's basically the same thing. So with astrology, could there possibly be a connection to the personalities of animals as well? Well, this is what Dr. Suzol Fuzao Braish was determined to find out. She and her colleague studied 500 dogs in the Paris region using the same birth charts that are used for humans. And she was able to correlate the exact personality traits of the dogs to their birth charts. It was a groundbreaking discovery. The study was called an empirical study of some astrological factors in relation to dog behavior differences. Dr. Suzel fazal Braish found that dogs with strong Jupiter and Sun activity were more extroverted, and dogs with an active Saturn were nervous. And these were descriptions that were given to the, her by the owners. It's not like she was seeing these things in the animals. The owners didn't know, didn't know anything about astrology in relation to their animal. They just wrote up a description for her, and then she look at, looked at that description and compared it to the chart, and she found these things. She found again. Dogs with strong Jupiter and Sun activity were extroverted, dogs with an active Saturn were nervous, and there are all these other aspects which astrologers say predict these similar personality traits in human beings. These are 500 different dogs. And you know, still to this day, this study is very, not very well known, even when discussing uh, scientific studies in astrology.
The concept of the moon's effect on mental health goes all the way back to the beginning of human history. Great scientists and thinkers of the ancient world, such as Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, wrote that the full moon can increase fear and erratic behavior. And this idea grew to become such an established, widespread belief throughout most of the Western world, and indeed pretty much the entire world, that people deemed mentally unstable from lunar influences were called lunatics. During the 18th century in England, this became such a big deal that a line was drawn between lunacy and insanity. If someone was found to be guilty of a crime during the full moon, they were given a lighter sentence because of what people thought the perceived effects of the moon on human behavior were. And although this is seen today to be in the realm of the superstitions of history, in the 20th century there started to be a great deal of scientific research, which was actually validating this effect. And up to the present day, there have been hundreds of studies which show that the moon does affect human psychology in precisely the ways that people have observed throughout the centuries. The full moon has been shown in these studies to correlate with higher rates of suicide, emergency room visits, violent crime, dog bites, accidents, crisis center calls, etc. Virtually every kind of aggressive, chaotic behavior has been shown to increase during the full moon period. And this became such a big deal that major institutions and police departments were taking it very seriously, and they still do. Several police departments in the UK deploy more officers during the full moon. The reasoning is not based on superstition, but instead hard data. Inspector Andy Parr of the Sussex Police Department is quoted in the London Telegraph as saying, I thought, we had a limited amount of men and money to spend, so let's look at the crime figures. I compared a graph of the full, of full moons and a graph of last year's violent crimes, and there is a trend. People tend to be more aggressive generally. But although the effects of the full moon seem to be clear to many people, such as Inspector Andy Parr, there has been an ongoing backlash by the more materialist factions of academia. Soon after these studies started flooding into the scientific journals, other studies started appearing which seemed to find no lunar effect at all. There ended up being a whole wealth of studies which found a very significant lunar effect, and a similar number of studies which found no effect. This discrepancy has been discussed for years and years, and it seems to boil down to differences in methodology. A recent study coming out of Queen's University, which was published in the Journal of International Scholarly Research Notices, illustrates this problem very clearly. When the researchers used a three-day model of the full moon, i.e. 24 hours before the full moon, 24 hours after, and everything in between three days, they found no significant lunar effect. However, when they used a smaller window of 24 hours, they were able to find a very significant effect. So the idea is that the lunar effect is not that long, it's not three days, It's only you can only measure it within a 24-hour period. The authors of the study write, Our results indicate that the use of def different definitional models of the full moon period influences the significant results obtained. Future studies need to be clear on their definition of the quote, full moon period, so that the results of studies with similar definitions can be compared. So, regardless of the pr pronouncements of the debunkers and the skeptics, the lunar effect is far from disproven. It's true that there has been conflicting uh, evidence, but there's also been conflicting methodologies. As the authors of the Queen's University study point out, the definition of the full moon varies widely. Some models lead to positive results, whereas other models which use a larger window to measure the full moon period typically don't come up with anything significant. However, it also depends on what is being studied. The stock market is an example of an institution which is highly affected by the ups and downs of human mood. Um, <clears throat> a recent study from professors Wan, Zhang, and Zhu coming out of the University of Michigan has found direct correlations between the full moon and stock returns. The abstract reads, this paper investigates the relation between lunar phases and stock market returns of 48 countries. The findings indicate that stock returns are lower on the days around a full moon than on the days around a new moon. It goes on to say that the data show that the lunar effect is not explained away by announcements of macroeconomic indicators, nor is it driven by major global shocks. Moreover, the lunar, lunar effect is independent of other calendar-related anomalies 
such as the January effect, the day of the week effect, the calendar month effect, and the holiday effect, including lunar holidays. So essentially the researchers say that the ups and downs of the stock market seem to be heavily influenced by the moon. And these aren't your run-of-the-mill community college professors. One of the people who did this study has worked for J.P. Morgan, the Bank of England, and teaches at the London School of Economics, while the other two are professors at major universities. And this isn't the only study of its kind. There have been a great deal of other academic papers that, showing, that show this correlation between uh, lunar phases and stock market returns. And it's important to remember that these are highly credentialed scientists who do these kinds of studies, who put their entire academic career in the line with this kind of research, and these studies can sometimes take years of dedicated full-time work to complete. So therefore, these results cannot simply be swept under the rug because they do not fit with the prevailing materialist paradigm.